throughout history the path of the aggressor has followed the same general course the pattern of quick successes and the eventual downfall of the conqueror has been repeated through the ages in the twentieth century this pattern was repeated once again at several points on the globe in the orient the japanese embarked on a program of aggression which was to follow exactly the time honored course For centuries, the Japanese lived in the conviction that their country was created by the gods as the center of the universe, and that they were destined to rule the world. This firmly rooted conviction was as old as the Japanese nation itself. Soon after Hirohito succeeded to the throne in 1926, as the 124th emperor, allegedly descended directly from the sun goddess Amaterasu, the program for extending Japan's rule began to gain momentum. The command of Hako Ichi-u to bring the eight corners of the world under one roof was part of Hirohito's inheritance. Japan extended its control over a considerable area following World War I in which it participated on the Allied side. The plums of victory included German holdings in China and the Mariana Islands except Guam, the Carolyn Islands and the Marshall Islands, all placed under Japanese mandate. In 1931, Japan embarked actively on its program of conquest. Clashes between Japanese and Chinese in Manchuria prompted the Nipponese militarists to take action. Without waiting for any formal declaration of war, Japanese troops attacked. On September 18, 1931, Japanese troops seized Mukden, Manchuria's most important city. And on March 1, 1932, the new nation of Manchukuo was proclaimed. The new country was supposedly independent, but actually it was purely a Japanese puppet state. The opportunistic weakling Bu Yi was made the new ruler and was later installed on the ancient throne of the Manchus by the Japanese, who kept a discreet but firm control over the affairs of the new nation. To all outward appearances, the new Manchurian leaders were merely friendly neighbors of the Nipponese. Actually, Imperial Japan dictated the policy in Manchukuo. In Geneva, Switzerland, in February 1933, Foreign Minister Matsuoka of Japan piously disavowed any aggressive intentions. It is a matter of common knowledge that Japan's policy is fundamentally inspired by a genuine desire to guarantee peace in the Far East and to contribute to the maintenance of peace throughout the world. Japan, however, finds it impossible to accept the report adopted by the Assembly. Monsieur le Président, Messieurs, c'est pour la délégation japonaise. With Japan's subsequent withdrawal from the League of Nations, its diplomatic position in relation to the other world powers deteriorated rapidly. Japan set out quickly to consolidate its gains in Manchuria, which it planned to transform into a large continental war base. A program of planned economic development was initiated and it was indicated that foreign capitalists would not be allowed a free hand in the exploitation of Manchurian resources. 
The new country was rich in mineral deposits. And the Japanese army, the real ruler of Manchukuo, quickly stepped up operations at key mines like the Fushun collieries. In the hurried development of Manchuria's resources, thousands of Chinese were pressed into service to work in labor gangs. The Chinese in Manchuria, who comprised some 90% of the population, had the choice of working for the Japanese for a meager living or starving to death. Opium was easily obtainable through a Japanese monopoly even though laws had been passed forbidding its use, except in the case of addicts. But unauthorized persons were able to purchase the drug illegally and were then often fined for breaking the law, thereby enriching their new rulers on both counts. A government system of checks on opium addiction was announced and supposedly put into operation, but no effective measures were ever taken to curb the practice. In strengthening its strategic position on the mainland, Japan moved quickly to consolidate its control of as many railways as possible. After seizing the Chinese-owned lines, the Japanese army directed that new roads be built. Several important lines which linked key cities with port facilities and a number of branch lines. This ambitious program of railway construction was designed to produce a network of routes over which Japanese troops could be moved quickly to meet emergencies at any point on the Japanese perimeter. Control of the South Manchurian Railway, Japan realized, would be of vital assistance in any movement southward if Nippon were to extend its area of influence on the Asiatic mainland. By March 1935, Scarcely three years after the new nation of Manchukuo was established, the Japanese succeeded in gaining complete control of all Manchurian railways. But Manchuria was only a short stop on Japan's road to domination in Asia. To the south lay the rich countryside of China proper, a territory which had never been out of the thoughts of Japanese leaders since the beginning of Nippon's program of expansion. In July 1937, Japan accelerated its timetable of aggression. Following a skirmish at the Marco Polo Bridge near Beiping, the war between Japan and China, anticipated for some time, passed from the period of small local actions to more concentrated warfare. After unsuccessful attempts at a truce, Japanese forces poured into North China from Manchuria, and an offensive was launched in the northern Chinese provinces. The Japanese advance against a somewhat disorganized enemy was rapid. Within a few months, the Nipponese had gained strategic control of North China. In Tokyo in June 1937, a new cabinet headed by Prince Fumimaro Konoe assumed control of the Japanese government. As premier, Konoe dominated the regime which threw Japan into war with China and brought it to the brink of war with the West. Committed to a sizable war on the mainland of Asia, Japan's militarists geared the whole nation to all-out production for the winning of that war and any other wars that might develop as Japanese forces moved farther and farther from the home islands. While the other major powers of the world were still at peace, Japan was busy testing the most modern weapons of war and learning from first-hand experience which were the most effective in battle. In the air arm of the Japanese forces, pilots found that the new Japanese fighter plane, the Zero, was the fastest, most maneuverable combat plane they had yet seen in the air. But in China, older models still proved more than adequate. In 
In China, the Japanese established their blueprint for victory. Nipponese planes bombed the largest Chinese cities, killing thousands of civilians. Special target of Japanese air attacks was Shanghai, which withstood a series of bombings before Japanese troops finally captured the city in November 1937, after a siege of three months. With the capture of Shanghai, the appetite of the Japanese army for still greater victories was whetted. The Nipponese troops prepared to press on at once toward Nanking and an unforgettable orgy of rape and pillage. In mid-December 1937, the U.S. gunboat Panay in the Yangtze River was picked out by Japanese naval planes. The sinking of the Panay might well have touched off a war between the U.S. and Japan. But the pilots had made a mistake, the Japanese claimed. Among the victims were the first American fighting men to lose their lives at the hands of the Japanese. The Chinese became the first refugees of the struggle which was to become World War II. This was the beginning of years of being always on the move for many Chinese. Already, peace was only a memory. As the Japanese seized new territory, they took over the administration of the area at once. In some localities, the new rulers tried to act the role of sympathetic, understanding administrators. But the Japanese plans for further conquest didn't permit this act to continue for long. The Japanese badly needed the services of the people they'd conquered. Chinese farmers continued to work their soil, but now the harvest would benefit the Japanese. Many men were put into labor gangs. The Chinese had no alternative to working for the Japanese, except death. Some Chinese labor gangs had the privilege of repairing buildings which had been bombed out by their new rulers. In one way or another, all able-bodied Chinese were worked unsparingly by the Japanese in their drive to bring more and more of Eastern Asia under the emperor's rule. With North China won and a continuing war with the Chinese in progress, the Japanese militarists looked still further south in their search for other lands to conquer. For the Japanese program of aggression called for a coordinated series of attacks on smaller countries with valuable resources, vital to the Nipponese war effort. The Philippines would prove a rich prize indeed. The Philippines had enough good timber to help satisfy Japan's wartime needs. On the mainland in Southeast Asia, Malaya was of particular interest to the Nipponese High Command. For Malaya, though not especially large in area, produced some 56,000 tons of tin each year, 30% of the world's output. Even more important was Malaya's wealth in rubber. That British territory's plantations produced more rubber than the Nipponese could use. If Japan should find itself involved in a large-scale war, Malayan rubber would help materially in stiffening the backbone of the Japanese war effort. At the same time, by seizing the Malayan Peninsula, Japan would deny Britain and the United States, its two most important potential enemies, one of their principal sources of rubber. Singapore, at the southern tip of Malaya, had great strategic value to any nation waging war in the lands which lay along the equator. The base at Singapore had a commanding position with relation to the narrow straits separating the Asian mainland and the Dutch East Indies. The invaluable stocks of oil in these exotic islands made them a high priority area for seizure by any Asiatic aggressor planning to wage all-out war.
These lush islands also produced most of the world's cinchona bark, from which quinine is made. Since quinine was the most effective preventive for malaria, the cinchona bark was of paramount military importance to Japan. Still farther south, Australia would prove an important prize for any warring nation. In the down-under countries, wealth consisted largely of wool and livestock, both valuable commodities. Meanwhile, in Tokyo, the Nipponese demonstrated their friendliness with another aggressive power, fascist Italy. The festive atmosphere was heightened by the favorable trend of the year-old war in Europe for the Axis powers. In 1940, the timetable called for further expansion on the Asian continent. In September of that year, Japanese troops put ashore on the coast of French Indochina, directly south of China. The landings were made without resistance. At Berlin during that eventful September 1940, the three aggressor nations of Europe and Asia joined forces and forged the Berlin-Rome-Tokyo axis. The German Führer was well disposed toward making an alliance with any nation which would help further his own greedy aims and which would not cause him any trouble in return. The tripartite treaty guaranteeing mutual assistance was signed eagerly by Germany's foreign minister Joachim von Ribbentrop and with equal satisfaction by Japan's ambassador Saburu Kurusu. The alliance was further cemented in April 1941 when Japanese Foreign Minister Yosuka Matsuoka paid a call on Benito Mussolini in Rome. The Italian people acclaimed the representative of the strong Asiatic power which would lend support to their dictator's own territorial ambitions. Japan's treaty with the European fascists gave it the opportunity it wanted to take over French Indochina, now controlled by the French Vichy government. In July 1941, Japanese warships moved into the harbor of Indochina's chief port, Saigon. The formal ceremony which made that country a Japanese protectorate was attended by the representatives of the French Vichy government, which was openly sympathetic to the fascist cause. Japan's army had gained an entire country lying along the vitally important coast of Southeast Asia without a struggle. Within a few days, Nipponese troops had taken possession of all of Indochina to the borders of fertile Thailand, still an independent nation. But freedom across that border was to be short-lived. In Tokyo in the autumn of 1941, relations between Japan and the United States grew steadily more strained. U.S. Ambassador Joseph Grew informed Washington that Japan might well strike with dangerous and dramatic suddenness. Attempts to affect conciliation of differences were continued, but to no avail. In an effort to weaken the Japanese threat to the Pacific world, severe economic restrictions had been imposed by the U.S. Japan's exports dropped off sharply, and the economy of the country delicately balanced with relation to its war industries and its foreign trade, was violently upset. Japan's diplomatic negotiations did not mean much. The militarists who controlled Nippon's destinies were already convinced that there was only one sure course to be followed. As the situation grew more tense, they pleaded for a unified national spirit. The Japanese nation is faced with a serious crisis and will more and more carry out preparedness for national defense. Under the emperor, it is expected that the whole nation will strive for the advancement of the Far East. In Washington, on Sunday, December 7, 1941, Secretary of State Cordell Hull worked in vain on new attempts at a solution to the crisis but negotiations ended abruptly. Early that afternoon, he received two callers, envoys Nomura and Kurusu, who informed him that the Japanese and American positions were irreconcilable. 
In the Pacific, a fast Japanese fleet stood off the island of Oahu, ready to carry out Japan's secret decision to plunge the Pacific into total war. The pilots of the carrier planes which were to strike the first blows dedicated themselves to their task for the glory of their emperor and in honor of their ancestors. With the fleet less than 300 miles from the target area, the planes took off for the kill. Even before the Japanese envoys call on the U.S. Secretary of State, Japanese bombs were away over Hawaii. U.S. forces had 260 planes destroyed during the attack and suffered the staggering loss of four battleships a cruiser and two tankers at Pearl Harbor. In addition, four battleships were badly damaged. Thus, at one blow, the U.S. Pacific Fleet was all but demolished. In Tokyo, Premier Tojo made it official. The Imperial Rescript declaring war has just been promulgated. The valiant Imperial Army and Navy are at present engaged in a fight to the death. Now is the time for our hundred million countrymen to offer their all, to pay their duty to their nation, and to sacrifice themselves for their country. The rise or fall of Japan, indeed the fate of the Far East, depends upon the outcome of this war. In Washington, President Roosevelt responded quickly. Rise offensive, extending throughout the Pacific area. The facts of yesterday and today speak for themselves. I believe that I interpret the will of the Congress and of the people when I assert that we will not only defend ourselves to the uttermost, but will make it very certain that this form of treachery shall never again endanger us. Both houses of Congress acted immediately with but one dissenting vote. America, therefore be it resolved by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled that the state of war between the United States and the Imperial Government of Japan, which has thus been thrust upon the United States, is hereby formally declared, and that the President be and he is hereby authorized and directed to employ the entire naval and military forces of the United States and the resources of the government to carry on war against the Imperial Government of Japan and to bring the conflict to a successful termination. All of the resources of the country are hereby pledged by the Congress of the United States. Is the second demanded? Be no objection. The American people, 
solidly united behind their commander-in-chief, volunteered eagerly to take an active part. During the next four years, millions of Americans forsook the pursuits of a peaceful life to fight the enemy on battlefields all over the world. Go forward, men of courage in the free fight. Let every tyrant feel your mind for freedom and justice. 